Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone and the Libertarian Institute. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Pierce of Politically Catholic. Find him at Popular Liberty underscore. All links will be in the description below. Andrew, I love the new name, Politically Catholic. Where can people mm -hmm. find your collection of research and contributions? Uh, you can find my you know, free, free articles on, <clears throat> or really, they're more like essays on um, you know, my, my theories at subscribestar.com forward slash popular dash liberty. They are free to look at. And you can also see my content at popular liberty on YouTube. And you can follow me on Twitter at popular liberty underscore, as you can see on the screen. Sounds good. Today, I want to talk about The Art of War by Sun Tzu. We're going to go chapter by chapter. I'm going to list some of the things that stuck out to me. I know you're a very keen observer of research like this on the Machiavellian attempts at uh, understanding power dynamics. So let's. Uh, th that's why I wanted to have you on. Appreciate your time, by the way. Mm -hmm. Chapter one, laying plans. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of ranks among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army and the control of military expenditure. All warfare is based on deception. Andrew, biggest takeaways from chapter one titled Laying Plans. I mean, you went straight to the first one that I, you know, really like to talk about <clears throat> because this is actually a really good tactic. You see libertarians use all the time very effectively. And, well, at least for winning the argument and, uh, you know, making, really making people think because the first thing a libertarian will always do when they're trying to argue is they seize the moral high ground. They're seizing the moral law. And that's what they're doing. And it's a very, very effective tactic. As you see, a good leader, Dave Smith particularly, is amazing at doing this. Like he really knows how to like seize the hot, seize the moral high ground and, and argue down from it. And this is, you know, as a polit as a someone who's politically Catholic, you know, I think we have a little bit better at it, but uh, you know, but this is a tactic that a good leader will always have. Because if you can command the moral law you know, people will fall, will, will basically follow you into eternity. And, you know, uh, but and it's funny because, uh, you know, that juxt juxtaposition is really ironic compared to the second one of all warfare is based on deception. <laughs> and the, uh, and it's actually, fun, you know, funny story from the, yeah you know, from the Bible where, you know, the, uh, you know, like in, you know, the prophet Micah, there's like this King Ahab is really, really awful. And so God's like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of having it with Ahab. And he calls the council of heaven. He's got demons on his left. He's got, he's got angels on his right. And he's like, all right, I'm, I'm deciding that Ahab's going down. Any volunteers? <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, and the, and the, you know, angels are all like coming up with ideas about like what they're going to do to Ahab. He's like, I want you know, him to die at like this place called Ramoth Gilead. It's like, how do we get him there? And he's like crowd, he's like crowdsourcing like the assassination of a really bad king. There's one angel who finally comes up, comes up. He's a demon actually, and he's like, uh, "I'm gonna. I had this idea. I'm gonna go to, to the mouth of all of his prophets, and I'm just gonna make a complete crap that comes out of all of it. Like they're just gonna tell nothing but lies." And the uh, and so God's like, "This is a great idea. It's gonna succeed. Go go do it." And so the what you get from this is that actually the. Uh, it's not a contradiction because you don't owe the truth to bad people like that. If they need to go, it's like, you know, like if the Nazis are knocking on your door and you're like, nah, the, you need to be saying, no, the Jews are not here. Even if they're like 20 of them, like under your floorboards, they're like, like no, it's like, they're not here. It's like, you don't know the truth of those bastards. And that, so yeah, it's like, yes, in warfare, it's fine. If you, you know, if, if this is a conflict relationship, you don't know them the truth. And, yeah, and that's consistent with the moral law. Mm-hmm. Totally. Uh, w when I read All Warfare is Based on Deception, written, I mean, however long ago, so let's say 2,000 years ago, how long was this written? Uh, this is like 600 BC. You're looking uh, at like 2,600 years easily. 2,600. Okay, so assuming accurate uh, transcripts uh, have lasted this long, let's take his word. Oh, 5,000 years of Chinese history, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, uh, uh, of any civilization, we should take this one. Um, when it comes to warfare being based on deception, you're asking people to risk life and limb for you know what you're saying here. So it makes sense that virtually all warfare is going to be 
either lies or heavily, heavily exaggerated. That's why it's no surprise that virtually any time you look into a war, even if it's someone as evil as Saddam Hussein, there's tons of lies surrounding it. Or uh, the, even the National Socialists of Germany, they still lie. Uh, they still try and uh, provoke wars by uh, provoking German ships, as FDR spoke to Churchill about in August of 1940. Yeah, it, exactly. It's or like you look at Zelensky and Putin right now. They're both lying. They're both full of shit. Uh, exactly. excuse, my, excuse my French, but they are. They're both lying. They're well, like, I, and and they act like the Ukrainian government hasn't been killing civilians in the Donbass since 2014. Exactly. I mean, it, it's just so unbelievable, but it's almost like you have to lie to people like it, it, it could take a lot to, you know, get someone to hate uh, the Biden administration. But wh how hard would you have to work to get someone to say, I'm going to risk dying fighting the Biden administration? It's like, OK, well, to get someone to believe that we're really going to have to step up the propaganda if that's what we want. And that essentially is what you're asking. The, the price is so high that you have wow. to really exaggerate it every single time. And that's why it makes sense that in wartime, it's a virtually deception on both sides. Mm -hmm. And the power you get from that. Because it's, it's like you, you're not going to get the whole point of this is to get power. And the uh, let, let me actually you know go on because this is like the, you know my number one thing right here. And you got, again, you see this again in that Bible story I just said, hold out base to entice the enemy, feign disorder and crush him. And this is my favorite because they always think it's their idea. I, I mean, you, you basically, that this is like the number one way, uh, mode of dealing with people. You make them think it's their idea. Whatever you want them to do, mm. it's their idea somehow. If you can get them to do that, you know, this is amazing. I mean, because this right here is like the whole idea behind like the GOP Mesa strategy, which is like, hey, we are going to bait these buttons bait these motherfuckers into, into screwing themselves and we want you know, like we want them to think it's their idea when they're privatizing the government <laughs> and mm. really it's our idea and we've just you know arranged the incentives properly and because this is this is warfare you know this I, I don't know them the truth i don't know them you know that the you know the name the, the real nature of what these actions are and i'm you know paying basically paying them to do or incentivizing them to do more properly so, uh, spoken and because all I do, hold out the baits, they'll take it, and they'll think it's their idea. Love it. Chapter two, waging war. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger that there may be advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Yes. Biggest takeaways from the Waging War chapter. I mean, this is like straight up predicted by my fourth law of archotropism that power is equivalent to you know the, your ability to project force over distance and time. So the more distance you have to project force over, the weaker you are. Yeah, you know, because mm -hmm. of that, you know, you're just spreading all your forces out. But worse is like you have to continue this across time. And so the longer this is going to take, necessarily the more costly this is going to be. The fourth law of archotropism is all about the uh, you know the cost function of power. And saying that this is not infinite, this is not like a magic wand, this still costs money. And because that is still locked into, time, into space and time, it's not, it's just, it's not a magic wand. And so when you are having, you know, really long protracted wars, when it's taking you forever to get your bill passed or something like that, you're what, what is showing you really don't have that kind of power. And, you know, perhaps you should focus on lower hanging fruit, you know, where you could actually get stuff that done. Because, again, as, you know, humans being economizing monkeys, we're supposed to, you know, prioritize, uh, you know, ends over means and, you know, cross time. That's, that's the human action axiom, basically. And we're supposed to prefer, prefer more ends for fewer means. And so if you're, you know, if we're going to be wasting time doing a strategy that takes like 70 years to accomplish nothing, and I won't say what, what that strategy is, but I'm sure you could take a guess. Uh, perhaps this is that you have your uh, power spread way too far out. This is not correct. And, you know, that's costing you this kind of time, you know, like almost a human lifetime now. 
You know, that's that's uh, apparently I think this has costed way too much, and we should cut our losses. <laughs> the next thing I was going to say on ch on chapter uh, on chapter two was uh, foraging off the enemy. Point number fifteen. Hence, a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own. Likewise, a single picule of his pro provender is equivalent to 20, 20 from one's own store. Now, the idea here is that uh, you need to be t taking, ch taking stuff from the enemy. So this is why I say tax the left. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's like, okay, this is their, you know, if, you know, we want, if we want to, to have our liberty, that means they need to be defeated. And the most cost efficient way to do this is to make them pay for it. <laughs> so when we're going to, so when we're going to be taking power away from them, that should be they should be paying for that you know it's like we're not taking this power away from them for free they need to pay us to do it <laughs> and that's the that's uh, what i love about desantis i i love how exactly. desantis is like hey you guys you think this thing called government is a fun tool to beat the shit out of us with you know what no, no you're gonna start no. having to bear the cost and look at how look at how these psychos they're like Whoa, whoa, whoa. Look at how my freedoms are being restricted. Now I can't talk about transgenderism with people K through third grade, kindergarten. Through, that, that's that's what they flip over, These um, th what they flip out over. So it's like, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to do more of this and raise the cost of being a statist. God damn it. This, exactly. this, this is this is You're the way raising to go. the cost of power. Exactly. You're raising the cost. Yes. Decre yes. D d decreasing consumption valuable. by raising the cost. Exactly. It's like if the, it, you know if the you know the, the the best thing we can do is if they're going to be coming at us no matter what, let's just make it expensive. We'll make it nice and expensive, and you know there's plenty of ways to do that. And I don't con I, you know again all warfare is based on deception. I don't consider it an aggression. I don't owe them anything. I don't owe them the more the uh, the benefit of the moral law because they clearly don't care. Well, it's like when I was broke and I couldn't afford my alarm system, I kept the sign outside that said protected heavily by this. I think ADT was the company at yeah. the time. It, it was so long ago. So, yeah, look, I don't. But all it's, it's not bulletproof. It's not like you couldn't drone my house or anything. Mm -hmm. But what it did was it raised the cost. Having a gun, having locks on your door doesn't make breaking in inevitable. But it raises the cost, so now you have fewer aggressors who are willing to come in. So this is such an important strategy that uh, we need to learn yeah. from. Next chapter, Attack the Stratagem. Sun Tzu said, In the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So... Two is better to recapture an army entire than to destroy it. To capture a regiment, a detachment, or a company entire than to destroy them. I hope I copied that correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. Second one. Hence, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Number six. Therefore, the skill for skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting he captures their cities without laying siege to them he overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field anything mm -hmm. on attacking the stratagem uh, this is the uh i want to you know go back to supreme excellence consist in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting therefore a skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting he captures their cities without laying siege to them he overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field this is by you know this is something i speak about a lot you know because this is like the number one thing i want to you know kind of teach the libertarians is the there's like you do not win by fighting it's like they are going to crush us they will wake mm -hmm. us if we fight them and so what we need, you know, like whatever you're coming up with a plan, it has to involve not resisting them. And it's a very tough, it's very tough to wrap your head around because like, okay, these guys are completely evil. Obviously we should, you know, give resistance to evil. No, what you really need to do is again, hold out baits, entice them, make it think it, make them think it's their idea when they're shooting themselves in the foot and not realize that this is exactly in fact what they're doing. And if you are fighting them, they know that you're the enemy and they're not going to trust you and you can't hold out base to them because they, they mean like this looks like a trap. And so if you are a real like, you know, hardcore ANCAP, you need to be like, 
I'm a reasonable moderate, actually. And, you know, I think, you know, far left Nancy Pelosi is just awful. And I mean, you need to look non-threatening. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, like, and I, that, cause that, again, that's, you know, how you get them to trust you when you are saying, you know, maybe we should do policy X, Y, and Z, which has incentives A, B, and C, which ends with the privatization of the government. <laughs> and they're mm -hmm. not going to realize it until it's far too late or something like that. And <laughs> this is the idea that, you know, that you go with is that at every time you say, oh, no, we're not decentralizing power. In fact, we're centralizing it into privatization. That's what privatization really is. It's actually a centralization of power. And you can see it because like the Facebook, they can sort censor people all they want. See, that's a centralized kind of power. And yes, it really is true. <laughs> and so when they're so when you're saying, oh, yeah, what we really need is a uh, a much stronger, more muscular state. And the way we do that is uh, privatizing it. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And uh, exactly. That's, it's like you can win against them without fighting them. You know, Lisa's GOP.org forward slash donate if you want to if you want to help me do that. <laughs> but uh, that's the that's the idea. It's like you can win. It, it, the acme of excellence is to win without fighting. Better yet, win against the enemy without them even knowing there was a fight. One of my uh, strategies now is I'm always like, you know, it, it's about time that the workers start owning the businesses they work for. What we should have are like, you should be able to say like buy stock in a company or maybe a different company if you want to be diversified. Um, unless you don't want to own stock, then you could sell it. It uh, does. Or if you don't want mm -hmm. that, that's fine. Yeah. But uh, so long as the workers are empowered enough to buy stock in companies, mm -hmm. which is just uh, having a stock market, which, as Misa says, is uh, the most important aspect of privatization. Yes. So it's like, <laughs> so look, the workers can own the companies. I'm giving you what you want. Can we tap into the trillions of dollars that unions have in reserves? Maybe give them. Uh, s some of those uh, stock options, please. Uh, I, I love that idea of uh, making oh, it sound like it gets better because that's like fifth own. generation warfare right there. Where <laughs> you know, you, you, like, okay, how would you do warfare in a pro in like a real private society? It would be hostile takeovers. Like you, you would have like Wall Street bets style buyouts, hostile takeovers, fire the lefty employees, and like that's how you would do yes. that. Like you, you would do basically what Elon Musk did, but as a decentralized, you would like have like an app for it or something like that, mm -hmm. where you know, that, like you, you say, "Hi, my, I'm like the Robin Hood of right of the of the right," and. <clears throat> We are here to, you know, if you buy your, <laughs> if you do your 401k or whatever through me, you know, it's like you can diversify however you want, but whatever stocks, you know, you are uh, holding with me, I will vote on your behalf as your proxy, which is completely legal, by the way, yet yeah, that you can vote by proxy as, as a corporation. You can say, that's my, pro that's my proxy over there. So I want, mm -hmm. you know, Nick Fuentes to, or something like that, or Dave Smith to be my proxy and vote for me on my behalf at all corporations and whatever they vote, you know, is, is going to win. And so, you know, and by the way, the right has all the jobs. So let's say, so we have a huge advantage in this kind of warfare because we actually make money for a living and we don't just vote for a living and the left doesn't have that kind of advantage. So like by even adopting this kind of warfare where they don't recognize there's a fight until like the very end, <laughs> it's like, this is the sort of uh, tactic that is going to like w that basically take them and their entire companies in whole and intact like Elon Musk just did with Twitter that was a hostile takeover that was warfare and mm -hmm. they never saw it coming they were just like you know two you know like it started like what April 4th and it's now uh May 1st uh you know it's like in a month they were on top you know for, they had been for years and years no end in sight and a month later all gone mm -hmm. complete change and and look at how uh, the, how much screeching you get mm -hmm. from the opposition. That makes them look so bad once they're they already weak. in a losing position. It's like it's like oh my god, now I have to compete. And and they'll even say like, well, now there there's a potential for misinformation after they just got caught having fifty one intelligence officials fake the Hunter Biden laptop uh, Russian disinformation aspect of the twenty twenty campaign. I mean, th they're just digging themselves into the, such a deep hole. Speaking of which, number 18 in this same chapter. Hence the, yes. saying, <laughs> hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the mm. enemy, for every victory gain, you will also suffer a defeat. 
this is what the idiot class doesn't understand about yeah. reading Mussolini and Marx and Engels and Bernie Sanders and everyone Popular. else. Thoughts uh, thoughts on uh, number 18 of this section? Well, I, you know, wanting to add my name to that list, you know, Poplar. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like apparently I'm the, I'm the fascist of Liberty Twitter. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's like this is the whole idea behind the arc. Why why I put out the archotropism framework is that here's how the enemy works. We really, really, really should understand him because if we do, it makes our the, our job way easier. And if we know if we know exactly how their incentive system works, we we can say okay, which baits are going to work, which ones will not. What's our, what it benefits them more versus us more. And this is, and that's exactly like how you win because you know what the enemy is going to do before he does it because that's what's valuable to him. And it, and you have to know him really, really, really well in order to do that. And you you can't just say power bad. It's like that's all I need to know. And it's like, I, 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 it's like it was that frustration that led me like, no, 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 we can't, we can't stop there. We can't just say power bad and not try to really understand it in order to calculate, you know, what we need to do about it. It's like you need to know the enemy. You can't just like and you getting to know yourself is uh, we're we're not going to go there. That's that's that that's uh, uh oh well, I we, we won't go that we won't go to that one. I well, won't share it, my. It, it, it's important to know because self knowledge is extraordinarily difficult. You can ask people what are you really angry about. And they'll have trouble putting their finger on it. What really makes you happy? Um, you say these things make you happy, but you just keep consuming and you're happy for five minutes and then no longer. Do you really have mm -hmm. self-knowledge? So, yeah, self-knowledge is vital. 2,600-year lesson that uh, some of us still have to learn. I struggle with it all the time, um, speaking from experience. Next mm. chapter, tactical dispositions. What were your big takeaways from this chapter? I. Uh the idea that the ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive like that one that one right there number 5 is by, i i feel like this is the most important that you cannot win on defense mm. like if you view yourself like you know a conservative say <laughs> and your only job is to just you know conserve what you know is just to uh you know conserve you're you are definitely setting yourself up as a guy who's always on defense and the, whereas if you are taking like a more reactionary approach, you know, like Catholic, like being Catholic, you're saying, no, 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 I'm pointed at the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and this is like an actual thing. I'm not, you know, we don't have it. And, and not like the kingdom of heaven on earth, but like the kingdom of heaven in the sense that this is how a Christian society should look and should, and it can always get better and better and better as humans always get closer and closer and closer to their behaviors uh, to God. And, if you and so you have something like this that that you can actually be pointed at and say, oh no, we need to actually build that. We need, actually need to move towards that. Uh, and this is actually what gives you a real, you know, right wing. And this is why I say it's like that we've we haven't had a right wing in the uh, in America since basically the beginning. And it's all been just like to you know the how how much how left do we want to be, and how quickly do we want to go to like the French Revolution, which is kind of where we are right now. And the uh, and so, you know, you you need to be taking the the offensive. You need to be attacking. You need to, you know, like, you know, it says in the Bible, hey, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Well, what are gates? What do they do? They're, they're defensive implements. In other words, hell is on the is, is on defense and we need to be attacking. And the like the way we do that is by really taking the fight to the enemy and kind of fighting them on their own terms, using their own techniques and raising taxes on the left. Next chapter, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, next chapter is titled Energy. What were your biggest takeaways from the energy chapter, Sun Tzu's Art of War? Oh, one second. I don't see that. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. My uh, book you know, has chat, has that chat. There we go, energy. And all, uh, the difference between direct and indirect tactics. Mm -hmm. And this is what, you know, you know, he, he likens it to kind of like playing notes on the, on like a keyboard or something like that. And he said, Hey, there's all these, you know, d direct and indirect ways that you can do things. And it's really the mixing, the mixing of them together. Like you do notes, like you do notes that create a song and you don't just keep playing the same note every single time. Like, like the LP just saying they were doing the exact same strategy of, you know, localism, uh, you know, 
single issue coalitions and intra party politics and national campaigns for 70 years now. It's the same exact four notes that they've been doing over and over and over again to no avail. This has done nothing. This is not a new strategy. This is the exact same strategy, the exact same four notes done the exact same way that which have not done anything. And what you really need is think outside the box and try a few more indirect tactics that don't rely on like a popular democ democratic movement. Because if you do that, uh, you know, they all, you're always playing on the enemy's field right there. Like what, and you need to be taking a, a lot more indirect approaches. Like look, look, look what Elon Musk did. did. You know, mm -hmm. we were getting, yeah. we were getting censored for years and in one, you know, if we, and we saw like what happened with Wall Street bets where they decided to, uh, you know, really stick it to that one hedge fund. And, you know, they, they and, uh, you know, why couldn't Melvin Capital? Like that? Yeah, Melvin Capital. There we go. Mm. And, you know, I still remember those tweets. God, they were funny. Dude, <laughs> and, they were brilliant. The, the uh, CEO's hey, view from Melvin Capital. He's just standing on the top of the building looking. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't it great? <laughs> Dude, well, my favorite one was, I mean, uh, some guys on what Reddit did more mm -hmm. to redistribute wealth in a justifiable way than Bernie Sanders or AOC ever will. Exactly. And that was just so beautiful and to it's, just it's know. And of course, the the idiot class called for more regulation. So this couldn't happen again. Oh, as, like the, uh, as like, and you attack the enemy in a place where they were completely unprepared because you were thinking mm -hmm. outside the box and you were thinking indirect tactics. And they, and you know, this was actually a point I could have made in the last chapter, whereas the idea is, is you you know, if you see that, like, this is like a, a point of, uh, Oh, actually we're going to be moving on to the next chapter of weak points and strong when we get there of, Hey, you don't attack the enemy where they're really strong, which is like the popular democratic movement. Like you're, you're in a third party and you're going after the duopoly, which is, together has like 98% of the power. And like, you think that like, this is by far the strongest where they, where they could be as like, this is not the place to attack the enemy where you attack them is in the places where they're not defending it. And, you know, and this is, you know, something Sun Tzu says a little while back, which is like, hey, you, you know, the idea is to concentrate your forces while dividing your enemy's forces. Therefore, you can always have, even if you have like a, a force that's like half the size, you know, by spreading theirs out, you can always be using your entire force against like, a, you know, a small, a few small contingents of their group. And therefore you can still yeah. win. And if you know how to properly do this, but by using indirect tactics to divide them, move them around, make them defend things and squander resources that really don't need to be defended, make them die on that hill of, you know, teaching uh, sexuality, you know, taking, teaching gay sex to like third graders, make them die on that hill. It's like, I really love to have that fight <laughs> because that's a really weak point. And if they feel like mm -hmm. they have to defend that, oh boy, are they going to look dumb? Well, talk about things that weren't being uh, defended. Would you have thought, hey, guys, uh, it's the 1980s coming into the 90s. We're going to need to allocate a lot of resources to making sure that people know what a man is and what a woman is. This way, nothing uh, terrible happens. You were, What the heck? Why would we ever have to do that? That makes no sense. It, mm -hmm. What do you think? They're going to start telling boys they're girls and girls they're boys. It, people would oh. never even fall for that. You're, you're crazy. But sure enough, this undefended area, they swooped in. And now this is what's carrying the conversation in a world where like poverty and war exist. Mm -hmm. They're like, is a boy a boy? Is it though? Can a man have can't get pregnant? Like we let's have a conversation about this, if, especially and, with kindergartners. And the way I feel about that is if they have to ask the question, they should be fired as CEO by, you know, the Wall Street bets firm. <laughs> And that, seriously, that's that, that's yeah, the answer. Is, uh, exactly. know, I don't really want to argue with you. Uh, all the right wingers, we have all the 401ks, all the IRAs, all the jobs, and we're the ones who work for a living and have savings. Lefties just spend everything. So how about we use all of our savings and uh, invest and invest them in companies that are trying to screw us? And we can fight them that way. And by the way, you know who's really, really in charge of the government? The corporations. And so I would, you know, I would love to see, uh, you know, if we had at like an app like that, I would love to see, you know, a uh, Disney corporation lobbying on behalf of, you know, libertarianism and the Mises Institute. I, I think it's very progressive, you know, yeah, yeah, like whatever Jeff Dice tweeted out that day really needs to be law. And seriously, that is like, cause you could say they have a lobbying budget that every year and you know, their shareholders might have something to say about that, or at least they should.
And I think they should be saying what we're saying. Just that. Next chapter, weak points and strong. Point 12, if we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us, even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need to do is throw something odd and unaccountable in his way. By discovering the enemy's dispositions and remaining invisible ourselves, we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemies must be divided. We can form a single united body while the enemy must split up into fractions. Rouse him and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Biggest takeaways from weak points and strong. Number seven, you can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defense if you only uh, hold positions that cannot be attacked. And this is something DeSantis does so well. It's like he always makes the left defend places they really, really should not be defending. It's like that, like it's like it's like they have to step on the landmine. He makes them like feel like they have a need to step on the landmine. And what happens? It's like the uh, you know they 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 lose every single time because he's you know he's saying we shouldn't be teaching gay sex to third graders. Like yes, we should. Don't say gay. And you know the, uh, it's like they look like such freaks and he and he makes his enemies look so insane trump did the same thing really really well where he like his and he made his enemies just look psychotic and <laughs> because they all that they, they had to uh like, like what they always had to uh you know be contrarian to him and they, he gave them no ability to say no and or to not engage in combat and but you know they always had to say yes to, to combat for, with him and so what he did was he always chose the issues where they were weak and they looked like idiots they looked like freak shows and this right here is that you know like hey we could use the same exact thing how about we don't attack the duopoly in the general election where they're not we're never going to win how about we attack them like down at the local level where there is no duopoly <laughs> and they're not paying attention yeah you know, how about we attack how about we attack them like through lobbying and, we, and how about we don't even attack them how about we just like tr make a trade with them and we mm -hmm. and we have a mutual benefit again you can trade value for value and get more value well, the same thing works with power. You can trade power for power and get more power for both sides. And if you uh, if you are attack if you are again if you are attacking them at all, attack them where they're weak, not where they're strong. But better yet, don't even don't even let them know there is a fight. You know, and you know, you can conquer them without fighting. Yes, it's possible. Next section: maneuvering. When you plunder a countryside, let the spoil be divided amongst your men disciplined and calm to await the appearance of disorder and hubbub against the enemy. What is that word on number 30? Uh, check that out for me. Oh, this is the art. Yes. Uh, number 30 in the maneuvering section. This is the art of retaining self possession yeah. to be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it to wait at ease while the enemy is toiling and struggling to be well fed while the enemy is famished this is the art of husbandings of husbanding one's own strength do not swallow bait offered by the enemy do not interfere with an army that is returning home when you surround an army leave an outlet free do yes. not press a desperate foe too hard biggest takeaways from the maneuvering chapter uh two, two one is that uh when you surround an enemy leave an outlet free do not press a desperate foe too hard this was a tactic actually that was really really mastered by the mongolians so what they would do is they would surround you with their horses and your your army basically and then they you know in order to get you to so that but you know by by leaving an outlet free they enabled like you know they did against like the kievan rusins back in you know when they were conquering all of like russia basically and what they would do is they would you know allow basically the you know wherever like the king or the prince was and they could kind of tell usually they would uh, leave an opening right there so that this guy and his main force when he realizes he's surrounded now he's going to rush out and take a small part of his enemy with him and then again weak points versus small you know strong points versus mm -hmm. weak points now they've divided his enemy they can send a, a few horse archers after the prince to shoot him in the back and the, and then and then they can fight a much smaller army using their main force and and lose less people <clears throat> and by uh 
and this was you know a you know a, this is again why you don't is, is that you are attempting to divide the enemy so if you're ever going to be pushing them somehow you need to give the the, the left always some sort of outlet where they can run and you can shoot them in the back uh, and the, the i mean it's uh, easier easier said than done with the left because they're always on offense but the uh, uh, and the other position which is i i think this one at, at number five in maneuvering is pr probably the hardest this is going to be by far the hardest for libertarians to hear maneuvering with an enemy is dangerous with an undisciplined multitude most dangerous and the uh, the idea here is that you know you need to be a unified body is like you can't this isn't like that you know at war is not the time to say well let's just like try a thousand different things you go over there and try that thing i'll go over here and try this thing and we'll just like let a thousand flowers bloom like this is not how that works you need to be united as a, as a one central multitude with discipline with good leaders who understand the moral law and can and know how to command people around it's like this is not you know when you are up against like i, I mean it, you you would never say that like okay the mongolian army is charging us you know how about you go over there and try some stuff and I'll go over here and try some stuff. It's like, no, you're going to get killed. Like, that's not how you win. This is war. It's like, you don't like, uh, just, uh, uh, there's that there, you know, that one meme that where it's like the, the, you know, the, the uh, Lulbert, uh, uh, you know, is standing outside of like the shield wall and the shield wall guys are all saying like, you do get in here. They're going to stab you. He's like, no, you're just trying to, you know, uh, take away my independence. And then like in the next frame, it's like a spear through his, <laughs> his chest because <laughs> he, he didn't get inside of like the Roman shield wall. And it's like, this is exactly why that doesn't work. It's like you need to if you're if you're going to be moving somewhere, you need to be moving as a united body and needs to be in the. Pro yeah, and if you're in a if you're in a democratic civil war, the worst place to do that is in a third party. It's like this is not the place to do that because literally what you're saying is I want to be on the uh, you know it, it, what uh, you know if you want to pivot to the Republicans or pivot to the Democrats or something like that, they'd be much better. Because when you are set, because whatever, you know, if you're in a civil war, the other team is necessarily an enemy. It's like they are necessarily not fighting against you. They are necessarily fighting with you. And by choosing the third party that is the really, really small party, you're choosing the really, really small and defenseless army against the big, powerful army. And you're saying now you're going to, as a popular Democratic movement, say, yes, you should really want to join the small army. Like we're gonna get screwed, and like that's how they—that's how instinctively how they think about that, and you know, and, and so if, if you want to be a movement, you know, you need to join one of the other ones, and you know, join the you join the Republican Party or join the Democrat Party, depending on your on your real preferences, and then take control of it. You command the moral law from within that part party, and you get and you I mean you see people who are really really good at this, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ron DeSantis, and. To a very to a more limited extent, Donald Trump. Yep, and you can see like Thomas Massey, Rand Paul, Ron Paul. What did these two people all do really, really well? Ron Paul particularly, he commanded the moral law, and mm -hmm. that, you know, and this unites people to him who might not otherwise agree with him, but recognize he's the leader. <laughs> and you know, and, and this is how you move people. He's like, you don't try, you don't try to really convert people. You just lead them. And they will let you do that. There's a, is they, they do not, you know, if you say like, oh, well, the problem with the Republican Party is they're not libertarians. It's like, they don't need to be. They'll give you power without being libertarians. And But power bad. It's like, okay, well, you, you should not be in this, in this discussion then. Yeah, uh, it's uh, very few people that I come across that will say power is bad. Certainly some LP types who will literally be like, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I'll ask them and they'll say, you know, I really think it's important we get Justin Amash um, on the stage. <laughs> it's just amazing that their whole thing is to not be offensive and not be scary. So not only are they losing, but they're also selling out. So it's not like, well, I lost, but I stood on principle or I won and I had to sell out a little. They're taking the worst of both worlds with this approach, and that's why uh, certainly I uh, I'm a big supporter of uh, Dave Smith. But um, I appreciate the contributions mm -hmm. of GOP Mises. I mean, uh, the intellectual ones are j just so vital, uh, or the uh, GOP strategy, which uh, yes. you refer to, all uh, all vitally important. Next chapter: variation in tactics. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. One. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Two, 
cowardice, which leads to capture. Three, a hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. Four, a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. Five, an over-solitude of for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. Biggest takeaways from variation in tactics. Yeah, the the uh, what what I like here is not is the uh, one before that in number eleven that the art of war teaches us not to rely on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our, on our own readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. This is you know, it's the basic idea that uh, you know he he was talking about this a little earlier. Uh, where he said to, uh, you know, the art, the art war really is to impose your will on the enemy and not have your will be imposed upon and not have his will imposed upon you. And the idea here is that you, if you understand you, the enemy, like the left, you know, they're always on offense. They're never going to stop. They will always come for you. So the idea is not that to say, well, maybe they'll just live peacefully with us in their own commune next door, next door to our capitalist society. And we'll just get along and it'll be great. And like, no, no, you need to physically remove them. I don't care. They, it's like, they, they, you, know, you cannot, uh, you know, have the, them be a part of the society. You need to understand they're coming and you need to be ready to receive them. And you, would, and you, you, you shouldn't be saying, well, what if they just don't attack? What if they're peaceful commies? Like there's no such thing. And you need to, and you need to be like, understand you know, you'd be making your position unassailable and imp and actively imposing your will on them to make them go. They are not welcome here, and they, they need to be moved. Couldn't it be the case that the vast majority are simply just people looking for a uh, s sort of latch on identity so if they were born okay. in the soviet union they would have been hardcore soviets had they been born under napoleon they would have been big napoleon supporters anything that's popular mm -hmm. they just feel security in. so is it necessary i mean god of the billions of leftists uh, is it only like you have to make an example of the aocs and the bernies and the rashida talibs and then everyone else falls in line isn't that a possibility considering they don't have this big strong intellectual foundation you they could get them one. to take any position at any that's time the, that's the thing is that you know, again because the, you can't reason people out of positions they were not reasoned into you know like they are you know doing this kind of out of instinct you know, they, there was no conversation that needed to be had there, you know, and they, they're the foot soldiers. Like you don't say, okay, well, I can't, you know, these foot soldiers, they were, you know, born in, you know, the enemy country and it's not their fault. This is all they ever know. No one was, you know, hatred for us or, or whatever. And this is all they've ever known. And we, you know, maybe we can't hold them morally accountable for that, but you still have to fight them. You can't plan on them not coming just because, or you can't, you can't say, oh, well, they're, you know, they don't know any be better. Well, they're still here and they're still a problem and they're going to come. And, you know, maybe if you can get to the get to their leaders first and just make an example out of them and then, you know, you cut the head off, the head off the snake. You know, I mean, that that was a you know position. That's a tactic that's been used, you know, time and time again from Stalin to George Washington. Yes, Georgie did it, too. When we had the, uh, you know, that, that whiskey rebellion, it's like, hey, we want our demo we want our liberty and we just fought for it. And what did the government do? We killed those guys after they helped us fight for fight off the king. And why? Because these are pe these are people who are lefties. They are a problem and they're always going to come. And so you don't just assume they're not going to come. They will. This is their nature. As, and the and they will always find useful idiots who will agree with them and follow them and and uh, and then they will betray those guys later on. And it's like they will do the betraying for you. It's like those useful idiots are, are like dead no matter what. Because let's face it, either we get them or after they win, their bosses get them. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so you can't hold yourself like you know back because of your know, morality that way because they're dead no matter what. They're useful idiots no matter what. And you can't argue with them. And you have to you know, be prepared for them to come, expect this, and plan accordingly. And that involves, yeah, making your – again, you, you do uh, have something of a defensive strategy, where, but the war – art of war is always won on offense. We saw that a few chapters ago where it, you know, to win necessarily requires you to go on offense. And this is the nature – this is why you say know your enemy – this is the enemy. They will come. This is what they do. They are apex predators. 
they you know that were back in the ice age you know we they we, we had a real use for them because you know we were we were the ones usually getting hunted and having these people around was really really nice because we could always turn that outward and you get to the you know place where we are now where everything's nice and warm and we have agriculture and all of a sudden people who are specialized for predation have no more they, yeah, they have no more role in society except to predate. So they're just going to do what they were already, you know, kind of ready to do. And you see the same archetype with Cain in the Bible where Abel was the productive one. And then Cain was no longer, and then Cain was, you know, a, uh, do he was doing uh, his farming of it, but then he you know, went into predation and then God said, no more, you're not allowed to be productive anymore. And I'm going to put a mark on you that says anyone who comes after you is getting like seven times the damage, you know, done to them. So what does Cain do with that, with that sevenfold multiplier? What, that, what does he do with that mark? He goes out and founds a city. He becomes the state. He's the first king of, he was the first king of earth. And well, you know, not of all earth, but king on earth. He's first earthly king because no one could do damage to him and he could still do damage to them. And this was, this was how he made his living now uh, was as a state. Uh, he was a monopoly on violence because no one could touch him and he could touch them. And so, yeah, it's like, and you have this kind of archetype of a person like Cain all over the place. Yeah, they, these people are there. They exist. They're predators by specialization, and they're always going to come. And you have to, and you have to understand they are a part of the human condition. They're never going away. And so, what do you do with them? Hold out baits, make them think it's their idea, make them think the whole the whole private property thing is their idea, and this is what predation really is. That's my solution. <laughs> is is ba you're basically like like creating a simulation to trap them in. And, you know, like, uh, well, like in Star Trek, where they trap uh, Moriarty in the simulation, like, that's the idea. It's like, you, you need to have something built for these people. Oh, yeah. And the they have an outlet. Just, be, it, just oh, this when democracy you the thing. Enemy, leave an outlet. Yeah. You, you can just say, look, this democracy thing. It's it's too bad. I mean, there's this guy politically Catholic and under democracy, he gets to vote and impose his will on you. Exactly. We're going to have to privatize everything. Oh, this exactly. is devastating. I, I'm mm -hmm. doing this for you. You're welcome. Uh, you, you can, uh, I'll send you an invoice later. Um, it's like you, ha you have to privatize this to prevent the right from, you know, taking over. Exactly. I know th those bigots. Uh, did you happen to watch my interview with Blake masters from like, uh, months yeah, ago? that was a while ago though. Yes. Do you do good. you see a lot of uh, positive traits in him that stand out when it comes to being able to take on uh, the enemy that uh, we're up against? Not just that. He's got the Julius Caesar phenotype on the nose. <laughs> like, have you have you noticed that? Like, he you know, looks I, like you, Julius Caesar. The second you said it, it hit me. But no, I mm -hmm. had not thought of that. That's funny. As I, and when you see as like, I mean, this is like the called the great man phenotype. I mean, you can put put him up to like. I, I put that phenotype up against like a whole bunch of, of like really like powerful politicians. Yeah, it's just something to do with that nose for whatever reasons humans see it. Like, Oh, that's the ruler. Got it. And for what it, <laughs> you see, it's weird. You know, I, there's no explanation for it, but you see it all over the place in, in human history. Where it's like that phenotype with the nose is like something is something to do with something to do with it. So it, it keeps coming back up. And at least with like Caucasian rulers, you know, like other other countries, not so much, but obviously. But yeah, you see it. But yeah, with Blake Masters, yeah, he he he's a guy who's he he, he reeks of natural elite, like someone who's mm -hmm. smart, savvy, you know, you know, ha has a cutthroat instinct, and you know, and has like just all of the right ideas about how the system works and how to be in charge of it and how to use it the proper way and have everyone agree that his way is the proper way i mean, he has all of those characteristics of a natural of a natural elite who knows how to get stuff done like yeah so yes i do see it i do see those characteristics in him next chapter the army on the march 41. He who exercises no forethought but makes light of his opponent is sure to be captured by them. If soldiers are punished before they have grown to attach to you, they will not prove submissive. And unless submissive, they will be practically useless. If when the soldiers have become attached to you, punishments are not enforced, they will still be useless. If a general shows confidence in his men, but always insists on his orders being obeyed. The gain will be mutual. Biggest takeaways from the army on the march. The, uh, you know, uh, 
what you know there's two points in here i really really like you know because you see these behaviors in the left right now where they say to begin by bluster but afterwards to take fright at the enemy's numbers shows a supreme lack of intelligence and the uh and if the enemy sees an advantage to be gained and makes no effort to secure it the troops are exhausted and what you see right now is kind of is both of these where they're you know they they're, they're they are trying to rule through intimidation in the media where they like they'll cancel you or something like that this is actually bluster because they can't actually back that threat up most a lot of the time to where because there's so many of us and so few of them and so little time and so when they are just you know trying to intimidate us by bluster because this is what it's showing is that hey that you know this is an it's an intimidation tactic uh, that they're, that they're trying to use, and but once they you know, but they because there's no follow through with it, it shows they don't actually have the ability. They don't actually have that kind of ability to follow through on on the on these kinds of threats that they make, and so like and so any good right winger should notice that immediately and sense weakness. Like the the proper response for when they uh start you know start like you know shouting and yelling and screaming is to sense weakness. It's like mm -hmm. that you know if they're yelling about it they're they're unhappy that means that they don't have the ability to do it because if they did they wouldn't they would just do it you know what i mean i it, if they had that ability they would do it and then justify it afterwards the whole the media like that's that's always their pattern is that they will always if they can do it they will always ra just rationalize it after fact and they if they're always screaming about something it means their power it's like when they're screaming about elon musk that's how you know that this is going to succeed is that they don't actually have that kind of power Oh, it's like you should know immediately that because they're complaining, it means that they're going to lose. They know it and that they can't they can't act on it. If they if they did, they would have and they would have rationalized it later. And it's like uh, Elon Musk was an Obama supporter. It's like you guys have so much and you still screw it up. You, it didn't have to be like this, yet you wouldn't stop poking this bear. You, you, you poke the bear a thousand times and he hasn't attacked you. That's amazing. Just give up. And they're like, nope, we're going to keep poking. Okay, son of a gun. I'm just terrified now at what's going to happen. And then uh, they finally because banned the, it. You banned the okay. richest man in the world's favorite parody site. For God's sakes, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even put it in those terms, but yeah. That's exactly what uh, happened. That was great. Uh, the Babylon B gave mm -hmm. Rachel... Whatever that guy's Rachel name Dolezal is, Rachel or something like that. No, it, it, Rachel, oh no, Rachel De Levine, De Levine, yes. or something like that. Uh, the uh, the uh, man of the man, war, of, man the of the year, year. <laughs> man of the year. Yeah, that's that's what got him. Um, next section: terrain. When the general is weak and without authority, when his orders are not clear and distinct, when there are no fixed duties assigned to officers and men, and the ranks are formed in a slovenly, haphazard manner. The result is utter disorganization. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. Look upon them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. Biggest takeaways from the terrain chapter. Uh, I really like his actual definitions of the different kinds of terrain, because I think that's by far the most uh, applicable to, to us. He says that... Uh, you know, ground which can be freely traver traversed by both sides is called accessible ground. You know, so in other words, you can move easily through it and, you know, and without any sort of resistance. And what kind, you know, this is where you get to, again, to be like thinking outside the box. Where is there not going to be any resistance? You know, that they, like that's the open mm -hmm. ground. That's where we should be like focusing all of our efforts on. Whereas if you look at uh, ground, you know, ground that's called uh, uh, narrow passes, you know, with regard to narrow passes, if you can occupy them first, let them be very strongly garrisoned. What that means is that a, uh, you know, a, a, a narrow, pa yeah, uh, uh, obviously a narrow pass means like, like this is why like 300 Spartans can fight off Xerxes 20,000, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, that for the most of the movie. And because, you know, it's a narrow pass, Xerxes has to, you know, can't use the full force of his army to get in. So if you can occupy this narrow pass first, 300 Spartans from, you know, can, you know, really, really kick the butt of a whole lot, a whole lot of uh, Persians at Thermopylae. And whereas, so, like, so let, let's put that into political terms. You're, it's a two party system. You need to be one of the first two parties. Otherwise, you're screwed. That's the narrow, the duopoly is the narrow pass. And the, uh, and so, 
you can't uh, you can't attack here. This is a strong point for the enemy, very heavily garrisoned, which is again that's that's what he says to do. And so the uh, let's see what there the, where was the other one? There was one more hemmed in territory. Does he talk about that here? No, he doesn't talk about that here. Okay, well, that's going to be the next time. That's next uh, chapter. Were the Republicans in 1860 a well, a single issue third party was not a three party system back then. It was not a two party system back then. So you could break in okay. a, a whole lot easier. Yeah, you know, Lincoln won okay. with only a third of the vote. You know, it's like yeah. he's kind of kind of like Hitler. He he won with third. Of, uh, Hitler mm -hmm. also won with a third of the vote. That's why the 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 you know George Washington and the founders really said really should only be two parties because Hitler can't get fifty percent of the vote. Neither could Lincoln. And mm -hmm. so it's like, if you look, and by the way, same thing with uh, Woodrow Wilson, all, didn't get a 50, did not get 50%. He was also mm -hmm. like 30 or 40%. And there was a dividing vote by uh, the Republicans with the Bull Moose Party, Teddy Roosevelt. And, uh, and Wilson won. And it's like all of them, you know, the reason why it's a two party system is to prevent the Hitlers, the Wilsons and the Lincolns. And because they, because the Hitlers, <laughs> the Wilsons, and the Lincolns, I know I'm so in trouble here. Like they can't get 50% of the vote, and they're the mass murderers. And that's the way, that's why it's a two party system is to prevent those guys. So if you're saying we need to divide the vote, what you're really saying is uh, we're going to give the left free reign, and whatever their worst person could possibly be, he's getting in charge. So the yeah, the guy who's going to start the the Civil War or World War Three, or I should say World War One. Uh, it's like he only gets a you know or World War II for that matter for the other for on the opposite side of the pond. It's like that guy only get you know, a parliamentary system. That's why we didn't do that here because Hitler can win in a parliamentary system with one third of the vote and cause World War II. Or like, Churchill can be appointed after uh, yeah. Chamberlain steps down from a problem that Churchill actually caused. And then he lost his first election in 1945. So mm -hmm. uh, Churchill and Stalin, the great defenders of democracy, never uh, were voted in. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's uh, l let's not make too much light of uh, <laughs> of this kind of yeah. uh, so approach you, but, to see, choosing like, leaders. This, this narrow pass right here is like... It, it was put in the constitution for a good reason. And like the, the founders were not idiots. It's like, they, you know, they really knew what they were doing. They made a lot of mistakes, but they really had a lot of the right ideas about what needs to be done. And, you know, it's like, it's like when, when we start questioning that, when we start, I'm not saying they're perfect. Again, I do say that they made errors. Uh, this is a, uh, again, they should have made this thing private. Should have made it a corporation. This would, that would have solved this problem, but, yeah, they didn't, but they had a, a lot of the right ideas. And because, and uh, like one of those is the narrow pass of the duopoly. Let's not try to fight that. Next chapter, the nine situations. If asked how to cope with a great host of the enemy mm -hmm. in orderly array and on the point of marching to attack, I should say, begin by seizing something which your opponent holds dear. Then he will be amendable to your will. Rapidity is the essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness. Make your way by unexpected routes and attack unguarded spots. The principle on which to manage an army is to set up one standard of courage which all must reach. It is the business of the general to be quiet and thus ensure security, upright and just, and thus maintain order. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances and thus keep them in total ignorance. On hemmed in ground, I would block any way of retreat. On desperate ground, I would proclaim to my soldiers the hopelessness of saving their lives. Bestow rewards without regard to rule. Issue orders without regard to previous arrangements and you will be able to handle a whole army as though you had to do with but a single man. Biggest takeaway from the nine situations. I really li like the, uh, you know, ground which forms three contiguous states so that he who occupies it first is, you know, has most of the empire at his command is ground of intersecting highways. This is where, you know, in politics today and democ democratic politics, we would call this an issue coalition. Like that, and but you have to do that from inside the party because that's where the allies are. So it basically, you want to be where your allies are, right in the middle, and because that's what you know, that's where what gives you this uh, ground of intersecting highways, which 
gives you that kind of power because you can like freely you can freely move through it without facing real any real existence because this is where your allies are and but in order to do that you actually have to have allies and you can't just say we are neither left nor right it's like no we're, we're one or the other and you know really i think we're right but you know, I'm sure there. I know there are some people who really disagree with me about that. That now the rights are evil or something like that. Or, but you, I mean, neutrality really is just not an option. Yeah, and it's not Especially really. In civil war. It, it it's not really inspiring. Too. It's like uh, uh, you want to grab on something that's already been heavily invested in and try and capitalize off that rather than starting from the frickin ground up. I mean, unless you have just some unbelievable operation at hand in which you're able, like if you wanted to hack the voting machines and make the LP win. <laughs> OK, well, then I'll start listening. But heavens, if it's like oh, we put 50 years of effort in so we could get Justin Amash, who couldn't convince a Muslim to read the Quran. Like, uh, could we not uh, be such cowards and embrace neutrality uh, when it, we're not grabbing onto allies? We're decreasing the amount of power and influence we otherwise would have. It's, it's so unbelievable with all this money. And then they're like, and then all of a sudden they have standards when Tom Woods and Scott Horton want to speak at uh, at Reno. They're uh, they're still having a vote, which uh, might exclude those two Seriously? from uh, fr from what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them. A a and it's uh, or uh, at least this was a post by Michael Heiss. I haven't talked to Scott about this, but mm -hmm. uh, Michael Heiss said this on uh, uh, on Facebook. So look that, uh, th that's dangerous. So. Uh, all of a sudden, it's okay to have standards. B uh, Bill Weld, uh, being a member of the CFR and supporting invading countries and murdering civilians. Hey, we need That's friends. Tom Woods, inherently evil. Can't talk to him. Ban him from the meetings. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing. It's like you, you should automatically see like a guy like Tom Woods, you know, would be perfect if, you know, to put in front of the like the evangelicals or the Catholics. And mm -hmm. like, I mean, that is, those are two, you know, like right wing groups. You don't have to agree with them on everything. He certainly doesn't. And, but you can put a guy like that in front of them really, really easily. And, and he, he comes off as one of them and, and like really one of them. And, you know, and they'll listen to a guy like that. Like you, you can put Tho Bishop in front of a bunch of boomer cons. He'll read Rothbard to him. And because he comes across as mm -hmm. like one of them, uh, like they will clap for Rothbard, not yes. knowing it's Rothbard <laughs> and not even knowing who that is. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the uh, another part from this I really like is where he's where uh, Sun Tzu says rapidity, it, rapidity is the essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unreadiness and make make your way by unexpected routes and attack unguarded spots. And you do, and if you're always constantly attacking them where they're not expecting you in ways that they're not expecting, and and you know and in ways they can't even identify as a, as attacks, you will always win. And you will and and because they are always off guard, and you need to be looking at not where your enemy is strong, but where they're off their guard. That's the opportunity. Again, I keep keep bringing this back to Elon Musk because he's a perfect recent example. I also have the same thing like with the uh, with like the anti tax and local government. This is unguarded. That is like no what there is no duopoly down at the local level. You can easily just walk right in and. Pretty and get elected pretty dang easily for pretty cheap, like you know, like one or two thousand bucks in a campaign, maybe uh, you know, in a suburban or rural government. And all you really need to do is just knock on the doors and introduce yourself to the people. This is a, 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 this is unguarded. This you know, and you can do these things quickly because nobody's stopping you. If you just put your resources towards something like that, you would win. And you'd make a lot of progress. I, again, I asked this to Dave. You know, it's like, how difficult is it to like make a million new libertarians? And you know, would you ha rather have a million new libertarians or ten thousand, uh, you know, libertarian mayors? Never mind the city councilman or anything like that. Just ten thousand mayors. There's nineteen thousand five hundred municipalities in the United States. Ten thousand is over half. Like, which would you rather have tomorrow? A million new libertarians or ten thousand libertarian mayors? He picked 10,000 libertarian mayors, which is exactly what I did. Why? Because that has real power. And it's completely unguarded. It's actually a very doable thing. Whereas like in the media, like you, you, like, you want to fight the, fight the press? 
That's very difficult to do. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's doable. Yeah, he's an expert at it. He would be, he would kick their butts up and down the stage. But, you know, how, like a million new libertarians, and what do you do with them? But, or, or you could just say, you know, how about we spend our vast fortune in the, uh, you know, in, in the LP or whatever on, just, you know, forget doing the state level stuff, forget running, running for governor, you know, forget these like vanity campaigns is what I call them. I think it's just people being vain. Uh, it's like, how about we just like, like, like Shane Hazel, he would have made an excellent city councilman anywhere. He would have made an excellent mayor anywhere. It's, it's unguarded territory. And like, he could have just walked right in. He could have done that very easily. And he's just doing like a vanity uh, play against like Kemp who, and Purdue who'd suck, obviously. But it, the, uh, but like, what's this going to do? Nothing. You know, it's not converting anybody. And you know, what would, would really convert them is if you did a really good job as their mayor. Yeah. You know what? Uh, Shane is actually a uh, friend of mine, so I will defend him in this aspect. Go I'd ahead. say maybe his biggest victory is getting Marjorie Taylor Greene to tweet about how, look, Republicans, uh, we lost. We uh, lost in Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. whatever that election sure. was. Um, we lost or almost lost. And the Libertarian Party, uh, a lot of people voted Libertarian when they should have come to us. Then the next tweet, so, so it sounded yeah. bad, like mm -hmm. people didn't vote. And then the next one was, so therefore we need to start speaking to these people or exactly. else they won't come to us. So maybe Round the benefit right there. is, m maybe the perfect benefit is just using it as leverage uh, against uh, p people who you think should be better on What'd certain you get issues. Out of it? It's like, I mean, the, the, there's ground of intersecting highways right there. She's a natural ally that you, you mm -hmm. like when you say, okay, we would reach out to them or like you're leveraging, like, what are you getting for it? It's like, what you really should have gotten is that, uh, you know, it's like, like, Hey, you know, maybe I can, you know, put it there. Hey, I was here. I could have done it for you. And, you know, but like, you need to like show something to the people to where you can be like, Hey, here's what I actually did for you. Here's how I, I, I actually, uh, you know, made your life better at this local level. This is why you can trust me when I come into the Republican party and say, you should vote for me. And because look at me, I actually did stuff for you. These other guys can't Purdue. These are a bunch of neocon bastards. They're, I mean, they're, they're not going to help you at all. And you know that these are, these are screw jobs. Marjorie Taylor green just said, so I got her endorsement. And that's how you use that is that you use that as like credibility, you know, in addition to an actual record of doing stuff Like you don't just like run against Kemp because that didn't do anything for anybody. It's like, and you know, by the way, if you help get, get Stacey Abrams elected, like, oh, they're going to hate you forever. She's a communist. It's like, I mean, that's that, that that's not a comparison. Yeah. Give me Purdue. Give me Kemp. Uh, they like those guys are awful. But, you know, compared to a communist, not even a close call. And I'd love it if they were Marjorie Taylor Greene were running for governor. God, that would be great. And I don't think Shane would run against someone someone like her because she is really, really good. And she is at actually an ally who would reach out to them. And but that, like you but you don't use allies this way. You need to actually join up with them and say, hey, if you know, it, like, uh, 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 you know, if Marjorie runs then I will, uh, you know, I will, I'll drop out or something like that. Or, you know, or better yet, maybe I just don't run for governor. I run for city council and I actually do the right thing for the people. And then they'll yeah. reward me for it later. They, and, and by the way, just doing the right thing right there is, is truly its own reward because it's power now. Again, would you rather have mi a million libertarians tomorrow or 10,000 libertarian mayors? I'd rather have 10,000 Sh Shane Hazels. And you know, t t Shane Hazel may mayors rather than you know a million new Shane Hazels, and mm -hmm. that's just that is like, and he, he and I don't get along, but I can you know, I can understand basic strategy that the, you know he's like the the guy I would absolutely vote for as mayor. There's no question. Well, yeah, I mean, especially anyone who's been in the military and now has uh, m more or less mm -hmm. is able to objectively analyze the state and the warfare state with mm -hmm. those kinds, with that kind of credibility, rather. Um, yeah. I think that uh, Shane's not well. only a, a good guy, but I think he's a total net benefit. Um, the next chapter, Attack by Fire. But a kingdom that has once been destroyed can never come again into being, nor can the dead ever be brought back to life. Hence... The enlightened ruler is heedful, and the good general full of caution. This is the way to keep a country at peace and an army intact. Biggest takeaway from Attack by Fire. Hmm. The, uh, I don't really have much to say on 
Yeah, I don't really have much to say on Attack by Fire. Uh, Next, uh, yeah. if, if anything comes to mind, you, you can uh, work it in. Final chapter, the use of spies. Hostile armies may face each other for years, striving for the victory, which is decided in a single day. This being so, to remain in ignorance of the enemy's condition simply because one grudges the outlay of a hundred ounces of silver in honors and el mal in el monuments is the height of inhumanity. Now, this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be obtained obtained inductively from experience nor by any deductive calculation knowledge of the enemy's dispositions mm -hmm. can only be obtained from other men i'll pause there for this section anything from those uh yeah quotes? the yeah. value of paying people you pay your people to get results yeah. as like mm -hmm. that like if you really want people to do something for you just pay them we have to I, like I, harmonize individual interest and group interest and that's exactly. the importance of paying and it's like, I mean, you have to understand a lot of people out there really have no moral compass at all, and they'll just do whatever they're paid to do. And they don't think about it that much. And there's a, a large, very large portion of society. I'm not willing to say it's a majority, but it's pretty close, you know, of people who will really just do what they're paid to do without question. And like, really, I mean, like, what was the Nuremberg defense? Like, just following orders, you know, it's like, a, like, that's how a lot of people think, you know, it's like, a, that's not okay, but it is how they think. And we can use that to our advantage and just understand this concept that People will just do what they're paid to do, and we don't really have to convert them. You know, we don't have to know their dispositions. We just say we we already know this part about them that they'll just do whatever they're paid to do. We already know it, so it's just like okay, find the money. And yeah, it might gall you, you know, like the way like he says to where uh, it's like yeah, you have to pay. It costs a lot of money and all that, but if you uh, do it like this way, then you will get results. Like you will know the enemy's disposition. You will know like what the congressmen are thinking before they do it. And, you know, and then, you know, once the, once you know what they're thinking, you know, maybe you, you know, have a little bit of money on their table or something like that. Okay. Don't do it that way. But the, uh, you know, you, you, you can always find ways if you have like their like chief of staff as your buddy, you know, the, that guy might give you a call and say, hey, hey, here's a heads up. You might need to come in and talk to this guy or something like that. Or if you know their, uh, like their policy guy, or, you know, their secretary, that's a much easier way to get in with them and to know what they're thinking is to have some spies and you know like a secretary or something like that you know no one cares about her if you just go in and ask her how her day is doing now when you meet her and you're and you're being nice to her like oh how are the kids and all that and you're just asking about her it's like oh she loves you it's like just great and it's like you have this actual people skills with people and you just don't treat them like they're objects and you mm. treat them really like they're humans it's like that's all the payment you might actually need. And that just costs, a, costs you a little bit of time. And you know, it's like, okay, what's your time worth, you know, versus other things are competing interests and opportunity costs here, of course, but generally it takes very little. And yeah. you, and you buy the information on the enemy and it's, and you, you really, you're buying the loyalty of people that works and it's something that will keep paying you dividends later. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, there's what people uh, can do and there's what they can get away with. Like the secretary example is great mm -hmm. because uh, they are required to, let's say, take down whatever note you gave them and then put it in a file, which ends up more or less in the shredder. Or mm -hmm. they could say, you know what? If you put X in the subject headline of your email, those immediately go to the top because they are uh, uh, mm -hmm. focusing on either current issues, they're donation related, they're uh, specifically titled to the person who's just above them, who talks with the congressman, senator, spokesman, whoever. So. I have been amazed at what small amounts of investment it was originally introduced to me in a book called influence by Robert Cialdini guy who works at Arizona state um, that there are of very small things you could do, which have an enormous payoff when it comes to things like social proof, telling people how popular are certain ideas. Now they're more likely to do it, telling them an authoritative figure. Hey, don't you know the, Pope says, or don't you know it was mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan who led us by saying whatever, choose your quote. My father quote, always whatever. tells me, 
you know, it's like <laughs> as a father's yeah. authority figure. Exactly. Exactly. So, so many uh, good things. The uh, chapter goes on having doomed spies doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. The end and aim of spying in all its five varieties is knowledge of the enemy. And this knowledge can only be derived in the first instance from a converted spy. Hence, it is essential that the converted spy be treated with the utmost liberality. Anything else on that chapter or the book as a whole? I uh, this is you know it's something that people should go through. If you really if if you're serious about liberty, you really need to read this book and mm -hmm. it, you know, adopt it into your, and adapt it into your thinking because. It's a very, very different way of thinking for like a more liberty minded person who's concerned with people's rights. And you, when we're in a conflict, you can't be concerned about that because definitionally it does not apply. They've, they've initiated this conflict already with us. And it's like, NAP doesn't protect them anymore. They violated it. It's like you now. This is this is merely a question of how are we moving from point A to point B. Like we've moved past the the more any moral protections they might have, any rights that they might have. We're clearly concerned with now with just getting to the end. And some things will work, and some things won't. And again, like yeah, you know, like I say, we can win without fighting. You don't have to really violate your principles all that much. You know, if you mm -hmm. if, if you are fine with holding out baits, and you're fine with winning without uh, without you know with, through indirect methods, like I am, you don't really need to violate your point. You can. I'm. I, I don't take that off the table, but you don't need to be like concerned all that much about you know using power in ways you might not like that you might not feel comfortable with, but you should never, never take that off the table. This is a war. Exactly. And it's amazing to read Pat Buchanan's work in 1999. He's saying in 99, he goes, look, we promised we wouldn't expand NATO. And now Clinton's brought in Poland, Hungary, mm -hmm. and uh, gosh, I, I forget what the first yeah. round of NATO uh, expansion was in 97. But he said, we're, we're really provoking a potential war with Russia. Yep. And if they uh, go to embracing nationalism because of this potential threat, last time they were surrounded, they lost like tons of cities and millions of their citizens. So they're not going to want to get surrounded again. Their grandparents fought this war. It's not like something that happened during Peter the Great. This happened when their parents, yeah. when their parents and grandparents were kids. So let's not do this. But unfortunately, we didn't have the power to make Putin a friend. Instead, we drove him into the arms of President Xi. My God, to drive him into anyone's mm -hmm. hands is bad, but to drive him into China's hands is just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. So that's why it's so important we embrace these things because sometimes you have the answer, but if you don't have the power to do anything about it, you can literally warn them to their face and they'll still provoke the war it's and like, say, look... I mean you could have a Cassandra complex is what I you know, think a lot of libertarians have is like they they're predicting the doom and they're saying it and they're right. And no one's going to listen to you because you don't have the power. And if you even just had like, if you were just even just their mayor telling them this, if you're a Thoe Bishop, you know, vice president of the Bay County uh, 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 Republican party, that's more than enough authority to where, Oh, okay. You have authority. I listen to you because that's what I'm programmed mm -hmm. to do as a human. I listen to the authority figure. I listen to, you know, Ronald Reagan. I listen to fatherly advice and stuff like that. And that's, but we're, we're, we're authority. We're, we're designed to be uh, hierarchical and to respect authority by nature. All you do is just, you know, appeal to appeal to this and better yet be the authority and people will listen. Thanks to everyone for watching Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone in the Libertarian Institute. Andrew Pierce of Politically Catholic. Thank you for your time, brother. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me.